千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. Welcome to Tao Talks with Derek Lin, where we take a deep dive into the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. As always, I want to extend my welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. I would like to invite you to center your thoughts and direct your attention to this moment in time, to the here and now, to be fully present and mindfully aware, as we are ready ourselves for this sacred process in the Tao with one another. Here we are looking at the chapter title. Gong Yong Zhang. This is the Tao utilization chapter. As we discuss the content of this chapter, I think it will become plain why it is titled that way. This chapter is all about the functioning and utilization of the Tao. You will see that Bowser describes the Tao as infinite, unlimited, unbounded. But despite being empty, the functioning and utilization is inexhaustible. There's a lot of deeper meanings attached to that that we will explore together. For the moment, please also note that most of the chapter titles are agreed upon across the board, but just like the edition of the Tao Te Ching itself, there's no exact 100% agreement among the different schools. Occasionally, if you were to explore, you may find different chapter titles but I've chosen the one that is most likely to be authentic and accurate. Now let us take a look at the chapter itself. It is a relatively short chapter. As you can see, we have nine lines and Here's is how it reads. The Tao is empty. When utilized, it is not filled up. So deep, it seems to be the source of all things. It blunts the sharpness, unravels the knots, dims the glare, mixes the dusts. So indistinct, it seems to exist. I do not know whose offspring it is. Its image is the predecessor of the emperor. So there you have the translation directly from the original where Every word chosen for the translation corresponds to a character in the original. Now let's take a look at how the lines will break down into multiple sections. There are three sections in this chapter, and they are the introductory section, section one with only two lines. Section two, four lines of the same length. All four lines are consisting of three characters each. Then we have the third section, which is also the concluding section. And remember, the best understanding of this chapter 
can be derived when you are unifying the entire chapter to make one primary point. And we'll be talking about that. But now though, how do we arrive at the breakdown of the multiple sections? Well, the primary clue in this case, in the case of this chapter, comes from the middle section, the main section, where it is easy to see that they form a poetic construction. We can tell because the middle character for all four lines is the same character. And when you look over to the translation, they are all translated the same way. So with the four lines, the syntax is very similar. The first character is some kind of verb. And the last character for line three is and line four, line five, and line six are nouns, are either things or quality. So they have an important point to make separately and together as a whole. We mark it off with a section divider between line two and line three, and again, between line six and line seven. So this means lines one and two are the intro and it's appearance that these two lines are significantly longer than the three carriage lines of section two. Then section three, the final section, the lines are longer as well, but not as dramatically as the first section. So this is a much simpler sectional analysis than what we've been used to in the past. The other repetitions in these lines are not so easy to see. One character that does come up quite a bit, you can see it next to the last character in line nine and next to the last character in line eight. It is the apostrophe S. So they are translated in line eight as part of whose. And then in line nine, it is translated as of. So now that we've looked at the sections, we want to explore them one by one. Let's start with the introductory section, section one. So this is uh, the most significant character to talk about. When we look at this particular character, this is um, especially uh, tricky for translation. And let me explain why that is. First, the character is pronounced chong. There's a meaning, this is a common character in modern Mandarin. In modern Mandarin, it means to flush with water, to rinse or wash away using water. Now, in ancient times, this particular character has a related but completely different meaning. So, in the ancient context, it means empty, it means void. How would that be related to the modern meaning? Well, the idea is that when you rinse or cleanse something, it becomes devoid of dirt. It becomes empty of dirt. You've gotten rid of it. 
Now, dirt and dust become significant later on in this chapter. For now, though, keep in mind that this is one of the many examples in the Tao Te Ching where the ancient meaning is related to, but different from the modern definition. This is the reason why when you just uh, have someone come up and say, oh, I have a translation and the translator is a native speaker of Chinese. Well, that may not mean a whole lot because of what you're looking at here. It is possible that the translator knows the modern language, but not the ancient tongue. It is important to have that ancient understanding in order for the translation to be accurate. So here, Lao Tzu specifically is describing the Tao as empty, but also unlimited. The, an example that we can think about is, for instance, the emptiness of space. It just goes on forever. There's no end to it. There's no limit to it. Here, Lao Tzu is also saying that it is like a bottomless container or a container of infinite capacity. It is always empty. It is never filled up. You can keep putting things into it. It is never over capacity because the capacity is unbounded. It is infinite. Now, let's take a look at the other characters that are significant in this first line. First, we have the two characters that you see in the fourth and fifth position. So literally, it's use or utilize and it. So when you see the translation to the right-hand side, you'll see utilized. This is basically Lao Tzu pointing out that it's not just a universal principle, it is also a tool that you and I can utilize. And in fact, the more we use the Tao, the better our lives become. So later on, Lao Tzu provides specific instructions and directions on what we ought to use the Tao for in our lives. And let's take a look at the other two characters, these two from the end of the line. Literally, these two characters mean not. That's a very common character uh, in this ancient usage and also in modern times. Bu always means no or not. And then the last character you see there is full. Not full is translated to not filled up. So it is not, this is saying that the Tao is not a finite resource that can be exhausted. There is always more. Those that have cultivated the Tao to a certain point where uh, the cultivator is able to tap into the Tao for creativity, they will look at this line and understand instantly what Lao Tzu is saying. They probably have had the experience of tapping into the Tao for something creative, creating a work of art, perhaps writing or music. When they tap into the Tao, they definitely feel that they are receiving this infinite stream of creativity that seems to be coming from somewhere else. The most common expression, the most common description from these creative types when they're able to do that is that they will say in a moment of that flow, that endless flow of creativity, the work, the creative expression doesn't feel like it's coming from them because it feels like it's coming from somewhere else. 
some kind of universal intelligence, they talk about themselves as a conduit. They'll say, I'm just channeling this. I'm just bringing it to you as it comes to me. I can't really take credit for all this. This is not me that's doing it. This is some kind of divine source. I can further share with everyone that this is definitely something that I have experienced as well. People will sometimes ask, where do you get your ideas? Because they ask that same question of all the authors that they encounter. And writers come up with different explanations, but I'll just tell them, I'm able to tap into the Tao, and there is always more where that creativity came from. So it is extremely powerful and it's available to everybody. What I would love is for all of us in this discussion to learn how to get into it as well. When you're able to do that, there's no such thing as writer's block. There's no running out of ideas. You never run out of ideas. So let's continue. Let's explore this concept. Let's look at the line as a whole to talk about what the entire line means. This line describes the Tao as infinitely usable and having discussed the breakdown of the characters, as we have just done, you see, you can see why. So the Tao is empty, and yet the functioning of the Tao is never exhausted. How does that make sense? Isn't that rather abstract? Is that a paradox? Why is it that the more you use it, the more you can get out of it? I mean, we don't see anything like that in life, right? It seems that in the material world, all the resources we have access to are finite in nature. You use it for a while and then you use it up. It is at this point that Tao Masters will say, but that is not necessarily the case. Tao Masters, will bring up the bellows as an example. There is nothing inside the bellows. Of course, there's air. The more you use it by holding onto the handles and pump, the more air comes out of it. So despite being empty, the bellows continues to function as long as you provide the, the power of your hands. So the Tao is like that, except it is not dependent on you or its source of power. It is its own infinite source of fuel or energy. The place where the hands represent when it comes to the Tao is that the hands, your hands, must initiate the process. You must do something to trigger the flow of creativity, the, the flow of innovations, and then you can start taking advantage of it. So that is a real life example. There is more, of course. Another example would be the musical instrument, the accordion. It works off a similar principle in that your hands are moving back and forth, working the accordion, generating the, the airflow into the instrument to produce sound, which as you play, transforms into beautiful music. So indeed, that is also Tao-like, that inside the accordion, there's uh, nothing there, but as you work it back and forth, it 
creates the airflow for the music to happen. Let's continue on to line two. Line two says, so deep, it seems to be the source of all things. Let's break it down first by looking at the first two characters in line two. They break down into two parts. The first character is deep, death, chasm, abyss. So it can be translated in a variety of different ways. The second character there, that is a sentence ending character. In ancient times, there was not the concept with uh, characters to have punctuation marks. Therefore, characters were invented to be at the end of a sentence and they serve different functions. There's one that is, there are multiple characters that can be used as a period. There are multiple characters that can be used as a question mark and multiple characters that can be used as exclamation, this happens to be one of them. So, I want to um, bring up that point because sometimes you do see uh, the original uh, characters presented with punctuation marks. When you see that, you can automatically realize that these punctuation marks are added by people in later days, in recent times, because the ancient classic Chinese characters have gone on for thousands of years without any concept of the punctuation marks as we know them today. Let's continue. So the exclamation mark there tells us that Lao Tzu is expressing his amazement. He marvels at the infinite death of the Tao. Then let's take a look at the rest of the characters in this line. We got five characters there. Just focusing on the five characters, the first one there is like similar to, then we have a character for 10,000, and then the character there, the middle one, which is the third character on the end, those are things, specifically living things. And when we speak of 10,000 things, that is often translated as the myriad things, because 10,000 was never meant to be literal. To say 10,000 things is to talk about all living things or myriad living things. Then the next to last character is the apostrophe S. And then the last character there is the character for ancestor. So when we put it together, we can see if we were to do a literal transcription, it is talking about the Tao it seems to be like the ancestor of the 10,000 things. Or that, as you see there in the translation, it seems to be the source of all things. And that is because the ancients realized that all living things that they see around them, including human beings, every living thing can be traced back to some sort of parent. And parents can be traced back to grandparents. And this goes back generation after generation to times in the very distant past. So they use their reasoning faculties and then think about what it's like at the very beginning. At some point, they have gone beyond the origin of humanity and the origin of living things. And then it can still be traced back. Every effect has a cost associated with it. 
So what if you do this to the ultimate end, which is the ultimate beginning of everything in creation? Well, whatever that ultimate origin point happens to be, the ancient sages decided that they would give it a label, the Tao, because it seemed to be the way of existence or everything to come forth generation after generation and thus able to trace back. So as we're talking about this, as we're talking about infinity, the unbounded, we want to start to talk about the way that the ancients perceived the Tao. What were their thoughts? We can summarize it uh, visually like the following. When the ancients observed the Tao, as we have just seen, they realized that the Tao seems empty, like a void. This void contains seemingly nothing except that we can tell it has the unlimited potential of everything seeking manifestation. Then the ancients also noted you can keep on using the Tao and never fill it up or exhaust it. This they know from personal experience as they live their lives, as they go through one day after another, applying the Tao to life, they quickly realized that this is a metaphysical resource that is unlimited. Then they also note, we cannot see a limits to the Tao. Therefore, it must be infinite and unbounded that there's no boundary, there's no limiting the Tao. And this is, of course, tied to the previous two points. So then finally, they noted that everything seems to ultimately trace back to the Tao as the point of origin. So all of this, these conclusions from the ancients, some may regard these as mystical, but then the sages will also make the point that, no, it's actually ordinary. It's not special, it's all around us. It is you, it is me, because we all reflect the Tao. Specifically, your mind is a reflection of the creative potential of the Tao at the personal level. We have firsthand experience with this. We know how ideas will work in the mind. For any idea, we know there was a time when that idea did not exist. We've all gone through this. If we have a brand new idea today, we know that yesterday we had no clue that this idea would even come up. And at that time, let's just say yesterday, we had no clue uh, what we would dream up. All we had at the time was the potential to manifest some idea someday. Today, with a new idea in the brain, it has taken manifestation. And then if we take action on the idea, the intangible idea may take on tangible reality in the material world. That's how the process works. So when the idea did not exist, where the idea ought to be, the mind seems to be empty of that idea. Furthermore, we all know from firsthand experience that we can continue to use our mind. The more you use it, the better the mind gets. There is no limit to it because all of your thoughts ultimately trace back to the mind, just like all of creation ultimately trace back to the point of origin that we call the Tao. There's no real limits. There's no finite number as to how many ideas 
you can dream up. So it is unbounded in that sense. Therefore, you can justifiably regard yourself as a mini engine of creation. No restrictions as to power consumption, no restrictions as to your output. Of course, most of us only use a tiny fraction of this incredible creative energy. That means we can all scale up. We can scale up our utilization of it, scaling up massively if we really want to. So the ideas that you act on, as I mentioned, it will seek the next level of manifestation, which is in physical reality. This can be anything, anything that manifests in the material world. It can be an object, something that you invent, but it can also be something that you create, like a new connection with people, something that you come up with, like a better method of doing something. Now, if you think about this scaling up, you utilizing the ideas as you presently do, and then scaling up to tap into the infinite potentiality of the Tao, if you don't stop at the personal level, but you keep scaling up and up and up beyond humanity, beyond all limits, scale it up to the universal level, to the level of universal intelligence or universal awareness, then there you have it. You now have a picture, a conception of the Tao in your mind. And the reason why you're able to do that is because you are a copy, a microscopic copy compared to the cosmic vastness of the Tao, but you are a mirror of the Tao at the personal level. So let us continue to reflect on this with another thought. Some thoughts about the Tao. We, you and I, are not the first to observe the Tao and come up with these thoughts. These are the same ideas that have been contemplated throughout history and in many different fields. So let me provide some examples. Here is an example from philosophy. Nothing is no thing, a form, a process, ever moving. It is the void. The void is all-inclusive, having no opposites. There is nothing it opposes. It is living void because all forms come out of it. So that is remarkably profound philosophy. It is actually the philosophy of a noted martial artist who combines Eastern philosophy with his study of Kung Fu. Then what about science? So in physics, here is what has been said by a well-noted physicist. The emptiness of the Tao can be compared to the quantum field of subatomic physics. The creation of the Tao can be compared to subatomic particles spontaneously moving in and out of existence. So, Actual scientist, actual physicist, the quote coming from the book, The Tao of Physics. The well-noted martial artist is none other than Bruce Lee. So the point to be made here is that in all these divergent fields, people whose work seem unconnected are actually connected intricately in the Tao at the most fundamental level, and therefore come up with the same realization.
let's continue our exploration of this DAO. We now move into the second section. This is the most important section of this particular chapter because this is where Lao Tzu moves into utilization. Lao Tzu is saying that, look, the Tao is infinitely vast. It's inexhaustible. It's meant to be used. Now let's talk about actually using it. We can see how to use it by observing the Tao process at work in the real world, in the material realm. We see what the Tao does. Then we take that observation of the external world and move the insight internally to the mind, to our thoughts. And we utilize the Tao internally. Let's follow this example and see how that works. First, line three. It blunts the sharpness. This is a reference to the Tao. It is saying that the Tao blunts the sharpness. The sharpness of what? Well, this is the Tao. It blunts the sharpness of everything. Absolutely everything. So this line has meaning on two levels, the external and the internal. So we start with the external. When we talk about everything, we literally mean everything from objects to surrounding. So the first example, we all know this, a sharp blade in time will become dull. And that is why blades need to be sharpened from time to time. So this is easy to see. Let's move from man-made objects to things that we can find in nature. A rock in a river will, in time, become a smooth pebble. And that is, of course, because the water of the river is flowing across that rock, you know, continuously, so that in time, it will be smoothed out. The sharpness on the edges of the rock will be blunted. So we can see how that works as well. We can look at, we can look in a river, and we can see smooth pebbles, and looking at it should give us a clue that this is something that has been smoothed for many, many years, centuries, millennia. This is the Tao process at work. Now it can scale up a blade and a rock, relatively small, something that one can hold in the hand. But as we look around in the environment, what about much bigger things? Things that are a lot bigger than us. Let's take a look at the mountain. Mountain peak will in time be worn down into a gentle rolling hill. Perhaps it will take a very long time, but it's going to happen. This is the Tao process at work also. It is happening all the time. It is happening everywhere. And with even just a glimpse of this power, the power of the Tao process at work, we can realize our own insignificance in the infinity of existence, that alone has a humbling effect. But then at the same time, if we move on to the next part, which is to turn the gaze inward to apply this internally, then it can be even more humbling to realize that we can use the Tao for ourselves. So let's explore that. Turning the gaze inward now to see the internal meaning of this line. So if outside in the real world, we've got knives, we've got rocks, mountain peaks that have sharp edges, what about the sharpness within? 
So right off the bat, we can point to arrogance and anger. We know that these emotions or feelings have a sharp edge. So then when we engage the Tao process within, it has a similar effect as the Tao process at work out in the natural world. So it is as if internally there's a river flowing over a sharp rock, reducing its edges. Just like in a natural river in time, the sharp edges inside of you will be smoothed away. And this is to your benefit. Let's think about how we apply this concept, blunt the sharpness into living our lives. So we transform from the Tao to our application of the Tao internally and externally. We'll start out with the internal, that is the mindset, what's happening with our thoughts. So you can see here that we've identified the three poisons. The three poisons are a concept that comes from Buddhism. They are greed, anger, and ignorance. They definitely qualify as the sharpness that is within us. As part of the personality that we started with. They are not just like the sharp edges of rocks or mountain peaks. They can be more like sharp knives. What I mean by that is even before these knives cut other people, they cause internal injury to ourselves. When I compare greed, anger, and ignorance to knives, the metaphor is that occasionally people use these knives, the knives of anger, the knives of ignorance or greed, and they cause damage to others. But because these sharp knives are not sheathed within, even before that happens, you've already cut yourself. So if you are curious about the concept of the three poisons, there is a more extensive discussion about them that can be found in my book, The Tao of Tranquility. It is all in chapter four of that book. So the Tao can help us in recognizing these poisons and can help us with transformation. So let me point out that the poisons may be the most apparent with anger. As I mentioned, even before you lash out at someone with an angry outburst, you've already been cooked by the anger because the anger has caused you suffering. A lot of times we talk about getting hot under the collar. We talk about someone having steam come out of his ears. You know, of course, we don't mean that literally. We're saying that this person is basically boiled in his own anger. It's like a fire within that burns you first. So then what is harmful internally is also harmful externally. We'll get to that. When we see the poisons as they are, we begin the process of blunting them. It's like seeing a rock with many sharp edges and then put that in the river to let the river work with the Tao process to smooth it out. So let's also talk about the external. Let's talk about what happens with the sharpness in the external environment. When we have the sharp edges of these negative thoughts, one obvious manifestation externally is we tend to 
start interfering with other people. We criticize them. We won't leave them alone. We just want to continue getting on their case. We know from experience that this kind of sharpness can alienate people, cause them to not want to be around us. It can even cause contention. But I think you know and I know that sometimes we can't help ourselves. Part of that may be because of the lack of awareness of the Tao, that we haven't used the Tao to blunt the edge. Therefore, we suffer from the cutting edge. So in using the Tao to blunt this, this edge, we can bring about more harmony. As this applies to the three poisons, let's take a look and think about how it happens in our lives. With greed, the Tao helps us manage our desires. We learn the Tao, we study the Tao to figure out the true meaning of contentment, to let go of clutter. These practices have an effect to blunt the edge of greed. When it comes to anger, we learn how to manage our internal states. We learn about calmness, about being composed. We learn that anger actually comes from fear. And when we face down that fear, when we deal with it directly, we can dissipate the anger naturally. And what about ignorance? Well, in the Tao, we learn how to learn. In the Tao, we learn about why we should learn. We also learn about how we should apply what we learn. It is the crucial process of turning book knowledge to living knowledge. And finally, we combine the internal with the external. We can engage in introspection to think about what we need to change to affect our external reality. Example, changing our perspective, shifting the perspective so that instead of seeking faults leading to anger, we can look instead for the positive leading to appreciation and gratitude. We can reflect within and manifest externally habits. Our internal states may surface as negative patterns in life, and this can be inclusive of addictive behavior. We can learn about that, understand them, and then bring about change by cultivating positive patterns to replace the negative ones gradually over time. That too is the Tao process at work. So now I think everyone can see that there is a huge amount of depth in the simple words, just a few characters from Lao Tzu. These are the things that Tao cultivators talk about one generation after the next. So going into the next method now, line four says, unravels the knots. This is to say that the Tao unravels the knots in time. Specifically, to unravel the knots is to reduce or resolve complexity. So this is utilizing the metaphor of a physical knot with a physical rope. In the external world, the knots in that rope will disintegrate in time. So sooner or later, it's going to unravel by itself. So how do we move that metaphor internally so that we can utilize the Tao? Well, the knots are metaphoric of complexities in general. So when we talk about untying or unraveling a knot, it is resolving complexity. Sometimes it is applied to resolving disputes. And we know from experience that disputes and conflicts tend to be 
tend to become very complex. And that is metaphorically described as a difficult knot to untie. In the Tao, though, one way or another, think about the Tao perspective that has eternity stretching all, all across into from the unimaginable past to the unlimited future. Ultimately, the ultimate resolution with the ultimate finality is death. So think about the most difficult problems that we human beings have in this world. The most complex disputes, the most contentious lawsuits, even warfare. In time, when we're talking about hundreds or thousands of years, all of these will be resolved no matter what. Just like a rope in time, in hundreds of years, will basically disintegrate into dust. And when we talk about death, it is useful to keep in mind that everything dies. Sooner or later, we will all encounter death. And that is what I call the ultimate resolution. With the death of an individual, all debts are cleared, all obligations are discharged. So no matter how complex the situation may be, it's never beyond the power of the Tao to resolve. Of course, the Tao process and work in the world includes more than just this uh, resolution with the ultimate finality. We've already talked about the other Tao process, smoothing out rocks in the river, smoothing out indeed everything in the world. We can easily identify even more components of the overall Tao process for the overall Tao of humanity. We see forces at work like progress, like obsolescence. Human progress is a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, we've got advancing technology. We know that we know for a certainty that advanced technology makes our lives more complex. And this can be seen quite easily in the field of communication. Think about primitive times before there's any of the modern communication technologies that we take for granted. How was human communication done back then? Well, you can imagine it's just face-to-face -face interactions, greetings, conversations. Now, how about when you advance civilization a bit to have language and writing, and you have a way to uh, record that writing onto a writing medium that later on was paper, but before that might have been tree bark, might have been bamboo sheets, might have been tablet. So we have an additional channel of communication, letters. Then, with letters, we also have greeting cards, postcards. We have ways of sending this recorded message from one place to another. Even before modern transportation, we could send a letter by courier from one place to another. Now, let's advance the clock on civilization a little bit more. We see telephone. Before telephone, we had telegraph. So distance communication. But basically, we're able to not rely on the physical transportation of a message in the form of a letter or postcard from one place to another. We can just call someone. 
And let's not forget, we've all gone through a period of time when the phone lines were being used for many other purposes as well, like, for instance, the fax machine. And who can forget? Pagers. Very few people actually use fax machines or pagers nowadays, but for some time, there were popular ways of conducting communication. Today, of course, we have all of the above. We have personal interactions, face-to-face, in-person meetings and greetings. We have, we still have the letters and cards. Those are getting used less and less because of emails. We can even send e-cards. And what about phone calls? We now have online chat. We have internet conferencing. We're able to advance beyond just a phone call with voice. Now we can, we can have video as part of the overall communication. And group communication, we talked about online chat. There's social media. There's message boards. It just goes on and on and on. So this is to make the point that technology makes our lives more complex, more things to track, more things to, to be updated, to keep abreast of. At the same time, another effect, we talked about this being a double-edged sword, another effect of advancing technology is that many of the material things that we had before, they become obsolete. They disappear from our world, they get integrated with other things and disappear that way. In effect, they have ended up in the trash heap of history. They, in some cases, transform from tangible objects to intangible electronic signals. Overall, there is a trend to go from things that are tangible to the intangible. So I want to present some examples to get everyone thinking about what's happening in our world. This, is, this also is the Dao process at work, something that we have to take into account. We're increasingly moving from the physical to the digital. We, for music, we used to have a lot of vinyl records, cassette tapes, music CDs. Nowadays, those are disappearing. Instead, everybody, almost everybody seems to have audio streaming services. Listen to whatever music you want, anytime you want. It's the same with the visual medium. For watching shows, we used to have DVDs, Blu-ray discs. We used to have video cassettes, VHS. What about now? Just like we have audio streaming services, we've got video streaming services. So the players that we used to have, the physical objects and the physical medium that we used to use to play in those players, they are disappearing. Books, magazines, newspapers, well, that's easy. We have digital publications now, I used to read physical magazines and newspapers. Now I just get my news online. And I imagine the same is true for just about everyone listening in. So the tangible books and magazines and newspapers have become intangible signals that show up on a, on a screen, whether that's a computer monitor or maybe your phone. We used to have things that help us keep track of things, lists, to-dos, tasks, calendars, Rolodex, contacts, reminders. More and more, those are all morphing into online apps, web apps, mobile apps. We can use apps without touching the paper that we used previously. 
And what about the things that we use to store data? We have drawers, we have file cabinets, we have filing systems. Well, you and I know that those are becoming obsolete as well. More and more people are utilizing cloud-based file storage. Storage that you can access from anywhere. Whereas your file cabinets that would be that would have to stay in one place. And what about photos and photo albums? Same thing. We have seen all of those moving into cloud-based photo storage. So the photo albums that we used to have, now we look at them, we see that they are limited in how many photos we can we can store in them. Whereas with the online storage for photos, we can easily, easily have hundreds or thousands of photos, more than we can possibly look at at any one time. We used to have yellow pages, white pages. Those are now relics of the past. Today, we have cloud-based search engines. So everything listed on the left-hand side used to be objects. They are being replaced by applications, digital signals, capabilities that we can access. So I want to list them out this way to make the point that if you think about the DAO itself, it has the parts that is affecting physical things. We are still physical beings. We interact with one another in physical ways. At the same time, it is also the domain of the DAO to operate in the realm of the intangible. Thoughts and ideas, feelings, connections, friendship, love, all of that are in there as well. So the Tao truly encompasses absolutely everything in the world. Technology is no exception. We can even extend from here into more examples. And you know, you can, uh, I bet everyone listening in right now can think about even more examples of technology replacing what used to be physical objects. Uh, the typewriter has become word processing software. The carousel for, for projecting slides has now become presentation software like we're using right now. The general ledger for accountants has now become spreadsheets. Cameras have disappeared into the phone. Encyclopedias are now just websites. The examples go on and on. So let's talk about other aspects to look at the DAO. Let's talk about next turning the gaze inward to see how the internal meaning of this line can be applied to life. So here we're talking about the mental landscape. And what this means is number one, Resolving conflicting or contentious thoughts. So remember, this line is about unraveling the knots, which are the complexities in life. Internally, it can be complex thoughts, which can be contradictory, and it can also have something to do with conflicting with other people, not just conflicting with other thoughts. So to reduce complexity simply means to simplify whenever we can. Dow cultivators see contention as being related in this category. It's a waste of time and energy. So to whatever extent we can to reduce that, to bring about peace, that will be advantageous for us. Therefore, simplifying thoughts will lead to simplifying life. We will be asking ourselves questions like, what is the reason for being contentious in the first place? 
it ultimately will not do anyone any good. And therefore, we would rather not spend the time or energy on disputes with other people. And as far as handling complexity, the advanced levels of DAO cultivation, basically DAO cultivators would actively organize, streamline, and discard, discard clutter. And there are people before reaching that level are simply not ready for that and will still want to hold on to their, pos to, to their possessions. They will resist, they will push back, but at some point, sooner or later, we all get to that level. So let's summarize unraveling the knots with the same internal and external dynamics that we looked at before. First, internally, with thoughts. Let's talk about conflicting or complex thoughts. A lot of times we say, I'm conflicted. I feel conflicted. Sometimes people say, I'm of two minds about that. So this is all different ways to talk about how we sometimes face more than one path. We have to pick and choose, and we don't know which way to go. Sometimes the internal conflict is not about conflicting choices, but then it can be about conflicting with others. So our goal with this chapter is to use the Tao as a guide to help us make the right decision. For conflicting options, when we have multiple paths to pick and choose from, the question to ask would then become, which choice is the closest to being true to ourselves? There may be a path that is extremely appealing, tempting, but then perhaps it brings us no closer to the Tao. There are paths that are tempting, but can take us further away from the Tao. And what about contentious thoughts? Thoughts about conflicts with other people. There are always better ways to resolve the conflict. To contend with others gives rise to even more contention Retribution brings about even more retribution. This is true at every level of the world, whether it's between nations, groups of people, as well as between ourselves and others, others around us. And we're, when we're in the middle of it, we don't see another way out. Perhaps we haven't looked at the situation from a different perspective. We can end up with the long drawn out situation where all participants are perfectly aware that they are trapped in a deadly cycle of revenge on top of revenge. But despite knowing this as a fact, because they're trapped, they cannot get out. We can learn from that as an example of what not to do in our lives. So this is where we ask the tough question. Are you holding a grudge? If so, it's time to consider letting it go. To make your departure from a toxic situation or environment. Utilizing the Tao as a unifying principle, not just within yourself, but also applied to life. Externally, about the environment. We just talked about managing relationships with other people. It leads to mastery of your world. And it's all about simplifying and streamlining everything. Still belongs in the advanced level, but to decrease clutter, to create space, is an important task. And as I mentioned, letting go of holding grudges to identify the sources of negativity. So there you have the internal and the external as unraveling the knots can apply to both. Moving on to the third method. Line five says, dims the glare. 
the Tao deems the glare. What does that mean in the external world? Well, in time, any source of brightness must dim, must reduce in brightness and then go out. The burning fire eventually dies down. Even a star eventually burns through its hydrogen fuel. So everything in time becomes dimmer. And when fire dies down, smoldering as embers, that is just a reminder for us that this is happening all the time, everywhere. In general, no physical illumination lasts forever. Intellectually, I think we can all see that. And here's something that we know. When light is at a moderate level of brightness, it can be very helpful. But when it's extreme, when it's excessive, too much brightness, well, hurts the eyes. We've all had that experience. So the context here includes both eternity and moderation. The eternity part is when we talk about how given enough time, everything burns out, everything becomes dim. That's the doubt process at work. Moderation, well, we talk about expressing ourselves in a moderate way. If we are in the extreme and we do so excessively, perhaps the light that is in you will become too blinding, too uncomfortable for other people. Therefore, the doubt process within you will help you take it down. So now that we're talking about the internal aspects, this is at the personal level, this is the application about the mind, how bright you are as a person, your mental brightness, your mental brilliance. So metaphorically, the arrogant person expressing that arrogance can be like a light that is too bright, showing off, hogging the spotlight. So far from being useful, far from being positive, it's a glare that causes discomfort. I want to point out that this is especially relevant for this group, for us. This is because I see so many people who study the Tao that are highly intelligent. So I know that we have many smart people in this group. Just as a sharp tongue can hurt others, perhaps inadvertently. Those who have that arrogance cause discomfort when they direct the sharpness of their mental brilliance against other people, like for instance in debates. So there is a connection between this and blunting the sharpness that we have discussed. Now, what do we do about this tendency in ourselves? Because there are many among us who are highly intelligent. We see this as a caution. The cautionary note from Laozi is for students of the Tao to not be so full of themselves that they use their knowledge for showcase or to put others down. Therefore, to dim the glare is another way for Laozi to express remaining humble. This is the Tao of humility that we're talking about. So as before, we can summarize it with uh, the internal and the external perspectives. With the internal, it's about your thoughts. We have an obligation to be especially watchful of arrogant thoughts. We have to recognize that the arrogant people will see higher and lower, superior and inferior. They will look down on other people. Our realization is the opposite. It's the realization that everybody is on a unique path in life. No one has mastered everything. 
we too are lacking in many respects. True humility can only occur when we have clarity of self-knowledge. So we emulate the Tao in taking the low profile naturally, like water. Water flows to the lowest point. What about in the external environment? Here, we regard daily life as endless opportunities to learn. We regard everyone that we come across as potential teachers. Now, the Chinese have a saying, when three people walk together, my teacher must be among them. So this is completely congruent with the Tao of humility. Tao cultivators do not place themselves above others and assume they know it all. They're always ready to listen. The default assumption is that we can learn something new every day. And that something new can be from anyone. This is openness. It is crucial. And that comes from the basic fact that we come into this world with different talents and abilities. That means nobody is the best at everything. After all, the jack of all trades is the master of none. It also means we're here to help and learn from one another. It really doesn't matter how knowledgeable and intelligent you may be. Whenever you are with three or more people, you can be certain that you will find valuable learning opportunities in interacting with them. So that's about the saying, when three people walk together, my teacher must be among them. Lastly, we move on to line six, mixes the dust. The Tao mixes the dust. On the face of it, this can be difficult to understand. It doesn't seem to suggest much of anything. The external aspects, we can see when we think about eternity, when we think about thousands of years, in time, everything disintegrates and becomes dust. And here is the crucial part. Dust represents the material world in spiritual traditions. It's very common in Eastern cultures to point to dust as a metaphor for the material world. Even in the West, we talk about ash to ash, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We talk about the dust being representative of this world, the mortal realm. So the idea is not foreign. The idea is not special or exotic. It's actually quite common. Eventually, everything, even the most valuable objects, become dust in the wind, given enough time. We have the illusion of permanence. We look at an object that is valuable. We think, we feel that it has a certain permanence to it, but where is it going to be? How is it going to be in a million years? And a million years is nothing but a blink of the eyes in the perspective of the Tao. So this is a key realization when we talk about transience and impermanence. Transience, impermanence are major terms in the study of Buddhism, but they apply to everyone else as well. The world is transient and impermanent. Everything changes, nothing lasts. When we understand this, it helps us let go of attachments. What about the external perspective? Let's cover that as well. So the internal aspects, is to mix with the dust, to live as part of the world. This is where we pivot from what we observe in the external world, things becoming dust, and apply that to the internal conception, what we think about ourselves as being part of this world. 
It's another way to talk about the practice of humility, to refuse to have anything to do with dust, is to keep oneself apart in an arrogant fashion. To mix the dust is to be part of the world in which we live. Dao cultivators do not set themselves above the rest of humanity to be apart from it all. Instead, Dao cultivators will not isolate themselves from civilization. I know this is a departure from the stereotype of the Dao hermit. This line tells them to participate fully in life and in the community. And that's the danger with stereotypes that oftentimes they can be false. So we're not apart from the world. Let's review what we have talked about internally as well as externally, starting with the internal. This is the realization that we're all connected with one another at a fundamental level. Sometimes you can feel that connection. We're all in this world together because this is the classroom. We are classmates. Whatever we do for others, good or bad, we do to ourselves because of our fundamental connectedness. We are fellow students. We are different because we bring different talents, different gifts to contribute to the team effort of the class project. So we're here to interact, exchange ideas, provide assistance. So moving from this internal concept to have it manifest in the external world, we want to first look beyond superficial differences among us to perceive our underlying unity. This is the idea that Dao cultivators have, which will be diametrically opposite to discrimination or bias. At a fundamental level, we are one and the same. Now, I know, you know and I know, that as we interact with people, there are times when we get frustrated, we get annoyed, but this is because this, that is the perfect mechanism for us to assess what we are in terms of spiritual refinement. We can tell how we have accomplished or not by observing the way we are affected by other people. Do they get under the skin? Do they make us mad? Do we understand that they are just a work in progress? It's much easier said than done because there are times when we're all hopping mad we're so mad because someone is doing something that they really shouldn't do, that they really should know better. And when the shoulds come up, you know anger is not far behind. But then if we take a step back, think about mixing with the dust, we're here for them. They're here for us. It may not seem that way right now, but that's the underlying truth. And one last point, equally important, is that we can be involved, we can be immersed in the material world, in the dust. We can roll around in the dust without being affected by the dust. We can work with the mundane without becoming mundane ourselves. In Eastern spirituality, this is the lotus flower being used as the primary metaphor for the concept. The lotus grows out of mud, but is not tainted by the mud. This is similar to the Western expression that we have, to be in this world, but not of this world. This means your internal cultivation does not have to be affected by your external environment. So there we have it. We have the four methods of utilizing the Tao in our lives. So we are 
at the top of the hour, and we should now be switching to the summary for today. The summary is a review of the four methods to use the limitless DAO. Number one, blunt the sharpness. As a reminder, it's about reducing the sharp edge internally and externally. Number two, unravel the knots. This is all about reducing complexity represented by a knot of rope, and again, internally and externally. Number three, dim the glare. That let your light, your unique special light, all your own, let that light be a soft glow for everybody around you. The soft glow is what everyone finds most helpful. A strong glare is what everyone is averse to. Number four, mix the dust. So this is about the message from Lao Tzu to fully utilize the world. We're in this world for a reason. We may as well make the most use out of it by mixing with the dust. We can do so without becoming dirty. We can do so while still keeping to our essential integrity, and that is to mix the dust without being affected by the dust. And this is all to further our cultivation. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.